Jimbo Paris, and you are listening to the Jimbo Paris Show. All right, this is Jimbo Paris here, and today we have a very interesting guest. So today we have Sora. She's a very interesting woman. She looks into a lot of different things like health, weight loss management, and from what I can understand, it's a new twist on the idea of intuitive eating. Oh, hi. <laughs> so um, it's not really intuitive eating. I know about the movement. Um, it, if intuitive eating worked, I would have used it, but it didn't give me enough control because what they say is very nice, but it's not very practical. So if you're a compulsive eater, intuitive eating is not is not going to really be comforting to you because you're not connected to the signals like they'd like you to be. So I created a way to physicalize stopping to eat before you put the food in your mouth. They teach you to, to rely on the body to know when to stop. But I had no connection with my body when it came to eating. So I had to create two, I mean, hello. I was like, it wasn't gonna happen. You know, they say, have a potato chips, count from one to 10. If, you're, if you get to an eight, you must be full. That's, you know, that's like, okay, that doesn't really work for me. But I created a way where you don't have to count to anything, but you manage the food before you eat in a way where you know when you're going to stop. So it's kind of like a traffic light. The two techniques are like a traffic light. They let you know when to stop and when to go. And, uh, and that's what my weight loss program is about. Well, I am sorry for throwing you in that category. But can we go into more detail on your experience with intuitive eating and why it was so bad? Well, I didn't eat intuitively. I mean, I'll give you some of my background. You'll see how I came to this. Well, many decades ago, I used to teach really challenged kids in Brooklyn. And these were really challenged kids. And I had 35 of them running all day, every day. And they were tough. And it took about five years, but it got really good at managing them, really good at keeping them in their seat, <clears throat> having them learn the material, and just keeping peace, you know? One day, I looked out at these 35 kids, and I said, hey, Sora, how come these kids who walk, talk, and do all those other things listen to you, but food has no animate qualities? <clears throat> And yet you can't stop thinking about it all day and you can't stop eating. And I was just enthralled with that notion that here I had these live human beings in front of me who were very difficult that I learned to manage, but food which just sat on a table, I couldn't stop thinking about or eating. So I had an idea <clears throat> and the idea was to eat any food I wanted but there was a caveat and the caveat was that I had to journal every thought prior, during and after every intake because I was completely driven to find out why I thought about food all day, completely. So I journaled, I lost 25 pounds that I've kept off since 84. And the day I reached my goal weight, I knew that I could transfer my classroom management techniques to food management techniques. And I developed this easy to use, eat and stop yourself, no diet weight loss program. Now, prior to this, I had been on diets, mainly Weight Watchers. I would do everything perfectly, perfectly. And then I would regain the weight. I would lose the weight, regain the weight. So I knew something was wrong, but I didn't know how to fix it. And I was determined to fix it. And so I developed an easy to use eat and stop yourself program. Um, I made my first business card in 1992. And then I wrote my book after teaching hundreds and hundreds of unhappy diaries, how to eat and stop. I, I wrote my book and it became published a bestseller award winning. And so I'm very passionate about taking the power back from the food, you know, and so that's what I did. I took my, I took the power back from my food and then I got my power back, you know? And that's quite fascinating. Forgive me, I lost my placing at the start, but I usually ask you who you are, what you're about, and what your message is. I think you answered that, but 
what is your message? I, th I think that's the last thing that needs to be answered. Well, I'm all about peace, you know? From the time I was a little girl, I've always wanted peace in my life, peace in the world, peace, first peace in me. I didn't know that when I was younger, but first peace in me and then peace in the world. So really, I think my whole life, I've been creating ways to create peace, whether it's inside of me or outside of me, because I just don't like discord. You know, I like to... I like to uh, take the high road, you know? I'm all about the high road, you know? So speaking of that word, discourse, how does traditional American eating create discourse? Oh, my God, that's such a loaded question. <laughs> that's a terrific question. Well, first, Jimmo, where are you located? So I have some kind of context here. Maryland, Baltimore. Oh, okay. So it's dieting. Okay. So dieting is a $6 billion industry. And what I like to say is if dieting worked, um, why would we need like over 150 diets? So what I'd like to do is, because um, that was a great question, I'd like to teach your um, viewers and your listeners why diets don't work in a very simple way. Then teach you're gonna me too. I don't know. Ah! Okay, so I'm going to teach you why diets don't work, and then you're going to see the discord very simply. So I want you and your viewers and your listeners to think about a diet like a clock, all right? So let's start at 12 o'clock. 12 o'clock, you say to yourself, oh, I need to lose weight. I need to get healthy. I'm getting married. I booked a cruise. I want to get new clothes. I want to look good among my friends. I need to take off some weight. So you say, okay, I'm going to go on a diet. So you heard of a few diets, you Google a few things, and then your sensibilities take you to one diet, okay? It doesn't even matter which one. It's the same thing. So now this diet was developed, in my mind, in a room, in a corporate boardroom with four people. You have your nutritionist. You have your psychologist. You have your cultural person who knows culture and body image and all that. And then you have the person who's on the money side. <laughs> so um, you've got these four people, and this is what they say to each other. Look, the people who come to us don't trust themselves. They can't eat and stop. So what we're going to do is we're going to set up a program that controls what they put in their mouth so they can eat and stop and lose some weight, you know, because that's the draw. Lose some weight, get healthy, however you want to frame it. So they create a program, uh, you know, they tell you what to eat, how much to eat, and when to eat what, and, and, and then you buy it or you go on it, you know, and you say, okay, this is it, I'm doing it. I made up my mind, I'm doing it. Let's get to three o'clock. Three o'clock is good, good, good. Yay, I'm so good because I've been following the rules of the diet. And uh, that makes me a really worthy person that I'm following your rules, okay? So you're following 12 o'clock's rules and you're really feeling good about yourself. Okay, great. Let's get to six o'clock. Six o'clock, all of a sudden, you can't take it anymore. I just want one more slice of bread. I just want one more piece of cheese. I haven't had Oreos in a week. I'm just gonna have three. So you buy the bag of Oreos, you bring it in the house, you eat the bag of Oreos, you have five more pieces of cheese and three more pieces of bread. Well, here's the good news for your listeners and your viewers. You just did the only thing that you could do to take back the control from the diet, those four people in the room. You had no choice. You were out of control to the diet. Now you binge to get control from the diet. But the irony is that by binging, you're out of control, okay? So you choose a way to get back the control that still left you out of control. So now what do you do? You beat yourself up. Oh my God, look what I just did. I'm not a worthy person. I'm not following their rules. I can't, I'm never gonna be thin. I can't do this. And you just beat yourself up. But the irony is you did the only thing you could do to take back the control from the diet, you know? So what do you do? You get to nine o'clock. Nine o'clock says, look, look, I'm helpless. I can't do this. 
I'm going back to the diet. So you go back to 12 o'clock, which is the four people in the room, knowing full well there's another in your way. And the reason diets don't work is because they're not your rules. They're not your rules, okay? And they're based on deprivation. So for example, if a diet says you can have three pieces of cheese a week, well, what if you want nine? You know, who are they to tell you you can only have three? I'm sorry, they don't they don't have that power over me. So I wanted to have what I wanted when I wanted it. Diets don't work. Statistics show that 97% of all people who diet within two years regain their weight. But still in this approach, how do you fix that problem? now? Because I think you uh, described think, the issue. Right. But. So I fixed it because that's what I am. I'm a fixer-upper. <laughs> I, uh, so I fix problems. That's what I enjoy doing. I enjoy, I think I just enjoy difficult things and try to make them simple. Yeah. So the way I fixed it, I love, I love that word because I really did fix it. When I journaled, um, when I journaled all my eating experiences after I finished dieting, I saw a couple of things. The first thing I saw, Jimbo, was that nothing I ate was ever enough. So that became very important to me. I, I began to see that whatever I ate, it wasn't enough. So I said, okay, it's my job to make sure when I eat, that I know I'm having enough so I can stop. So how do you do that? I created a technique. Okay, so that was number one, that nothing was enough. And then number two, true confessions, that they used to say in that old magazine when I was a teenager, there were times I didn't want to stop and I didn't want enough. I just wanted to go on endlessly. So I learned to accept the part of me that didn't want to stop and then I learned to accept the part of me that wanted enough. And I created two techniques that allow me to manage either part. So with your permission, I'd like to teach you how to use the green technique, which is uh, one of the two techniques in my book. Um, I don't have a copyright at hand, but my book is Eat What You Want, Stop When You Want. You'll notice it's a traffic light. One sec, I just wanna show you, cause then you're gonna see it perfectly. So this is my book cover, Eat What You Want, Stop When You Want, a no diet weight loss program. And you'll see I have a traffic light with two mouths in it, eat and stop. So what I'm gonna teach you now is how to use the green technique and how to be able to eat and stop for the rest of your life. You ready? Sure thing. Okay, so what food, uh, Jimbo, do you have the hardest time stopping eating? Like they're really the most hard. If I'm going to be honest with you, I like pizza. You, uh, I you know, like, I actually uh, have. A... Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, pizza is a big one. Yeah, meat lovers. Okay. Okay, so I actually have a pitch that I use called "Eat more, pe eat more pizza and chocolate and lose weight." So now I'm going to show you how to eat the pizza that you want and lose weight if that's what you want. So I want all your viewers and all your listeners to think of their worst food, like the food that really is hard for them to stop. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use this piece of paper and this is gonna be my chocolate bar because my chocolate bar was, chocolate was my killer, you know? So um, the first thing I'm gonna do is look at the chocolate bar and I'm gonna ask myself two questions, which I'm gonna ask you to ask yourself while you're watching this. Okay, as a matter of fact, we're gonna do it with you. Put the pizza on your plate, take the pizza you want and put it on your plate right now. So, right, I'm, you know, I'm an educator, so let's pretend, exactly. Pizza now, on I'm, my plate. Okay, I want you to look at that pizza, Jimbo. I want you to ask yourself two questions. How much is enough and how much is too much? So pretend to ask yourself now, how much is enough and how much is too much? So what are your answers? One slice is enough, whole plate too much. Okay. Well, wait a second. Now I have to ask some other logistics. How many pizza, slices of pizza did you take that one slice from? 
Six. Okay, so there were six slices in a pie, and you took one slice out, and that slice is on the plate. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Well, now there's two steps in this because you took the slice from six slices, okay? But for the, I'm going to tell you in a minute. For those people who chose a candy bar or an ice cream sandwich, what you're going to do now is I'm going to tell you what to do after I tell Jimbo what to do. So the pizza's on your plate. Now I want you to look at that slice of pizza again. I want you to ask yourself the same two questions. How much is enough? and how much is too much. And then I want you to separate physically the two amounts on your plate. So when you look in front of you, you should have two amounts, Jimbo. One amount that's enough and one amount that's too much, even if it's just a little teeny tiny bit. It's for the one slice of pizza, right? Correct. So okay. you did it from the pie. Now we're gonna do it for the slice. So even if it's just a tiny, teeny bit, you must take off what I call a marker. So how much is your marker? Like, I want you to physically separate the two now, physically, on the plate. So I'm taking the two slices of pizza, separating it. Correct. So now you should have two pieces of pizza in front of you. You should have the, the portion that's enough and then the amount that's too much. Are we okay? Yes. Now you can eat and stop. Why? Okay, so I want you to pretend to eat the amount you decided was enough, but not your marker. Not your okay. marker. I'm putting my so marker down. I'm having the one that's enough. Oh. Right. So we eat the amount that's enough. Okay. Now, when you finish the amount that's enough, I want you to look at your marker. Look at the look at your marker, the amount that's left over. Yep. Picking okay. up now. Right, and, and that marker says, I helped you eat and stop. I helped you eat and stop. And the reason it helped you eat and stop, Jimbo, is because you ate enough. That marker mm -hmm. lets you know that you had enough. And when you have enough, can you stop? Yeah. Okay, yes. Right. So no. So from now on for the rest of your life, let's say you go to a store. There's six pieces on the thing. You take one piece. You ask yourself, how much is enough? How much is too much? Separate the two pieces on your plate. Eat the amount that's enough, but never your marker. Now, let's say you, and that lets you know you ate and stopped because enough made you a self-stopper. Enough, having enough. But you don't know. Before you met me, nothing was enough because you hadn't pre-decided how much was enough. It's the same thing with money. If you go in to buy a shirt and you're going to spend $37 and you decide that's enough. So, um, so, so what I'm saying is, so that's the basic concept. You are now in control by deciding how much is enough before you eat. So for those folks who have the chocolate bar, all you have to do is scratch off a little off your chocolate bar. You can have the whole chocolate bar, but you have to scratch off a little under your nail. Or you can mm. have like um, an ice cream bar, but you have to scratch. You gave some really good advice there. Thank you. Well, it, it, it works. The thing is, Jimbo, the only way to control anything is to decide, no matter whether it's money, food, um, anything, is you have to decide how much is enough. Because if, if nothing is enough, you're constantly in deprivation. You're constantly in deprivation. So it's just how it goes. It's like a fact. It's a fact that I learned the hard way, but now I'm able to teach, you know? Um, so, you know, and, and that's the green technique. And then there's another technique in my book, but folks have to buy it to learn the other technique. What's the name of the book again? Oh, the name of my book is um, What You Want, Stop When You Want, a no diet weight loss program and and my website's www.nodieting.net excellent and you can and you can get it at amazon barnes and nobles or your local bookstore they'll order it for you so i'm um, i'm all about peace you know you want peace you have to have enough now how does this work with different types of portions so what happened with being a volunteer for rescuing dogs. 
Oh, yeah. Well, I love dogs, but I live in a small studio apartment in Manhattan. So I'm also a writer. <laughs> and I just don't have the emotional energy to deal with some art um, at me while I'm trying to write. So that's why I do rescue because I love dogs. You know, okay. they just to me, they're humans. Well, animals to me are humans. So, so let's say if you're this, this diet sounds very dynamic, if you will, but portions are going to be different everywhere. So how about this? The time you were traveling to India, okay, how did you work that through? Oh, how do you know I went to India? I did go to India, but how do you know I went to India? Uh-oh. Oh, you must have read my blog. <laughs> Oh, that's a great question. Yes, I, I went to India. Um, I went all over before COVID, but uh, let's not even go there because I miss traveling so much. So, um, okay, so traveling is very interesting. And uh, I apply, to me, I'm the same whether I'm in India or I'm in Brooklyn. It's the same thing. I use my red and green technique. Now, I do travel with food, I will tell you. So I do travel with some of my own food because here's the deal. I've been on many, many tours in my life. I've been traveling since I was young, very young. When you land in a country and you, I remember getting to China, it was like 10 in the morning after, eight, after 18 or 20 hours. They go, okay, first tour is in 45 minutes. I got to eat. I'm in a hotel. I don't know where I am. So what I, okay, what I do is I bring a few cans of flip tuna. I bring one package of crackers, four plastic forks, some Ziploc bags to take some breakfast buns from the table and uh, sucking candies, chocolate bars. I mean, you know, I come with like a little department store on the right side of my luggage. So I'm never without food, but, but here's the deal. You can put... I've been in Tibet, I've been in Nepal, I've been in India, Thailand. I always use my marker because you see, I'll share something interesting with you. It's not about the food, Jimbo. Food is the object of the challenge, not the challenge. The real challenge for your listeners and yourself is the way you use chewing to control your life. Because the act connected with food is the act of chewing. And I have this theory, this, there's two basic actions in your life that you can take that demonstrate what kind of life you're leading in terms of your emotional management system. And that is chewing and doing. So someone who uses food all the time is going to go to food to move forward by chewing their feelings, never taking a look at their feelings, so they're really not chewing food. They're chewing not to see, you know, they're really chewing not to see, not to, not to work it out in a way, you know, they work it out with food, but they don't really work it out in the real world. They work it out, not exactly to their advantage. So, um, so what I'm saying is that um, this pro, okay. So this program, let me make it simple. This program, and I've never said this on live anything, but the bottom line is this reduces the amount of time you're gonna chew a day. So this is really what this comes down to. This is a chewing reduction program, but you can't reduce your daily chewing until you reduce the number of times a day you think about food that you can potentially act on it. So I've never ever said that, but the deal is until you reduce the amount of food you chew by enjoying the foods you like, you're never really going to be healed. It sounds heavy, I know. I didn't mean to get heavy, but I don't even say that in my book. You know, because I think it's important to be real with people at times, because if you just play it light and you kind of lie to people, well, I don't lie. I can't remember my lies. That's why I don't lie. I forget it. At this point in my life, the only thing I have are my truths. I live, I'm very big on truth. You know, um, I live from my truth. That's extremely important to me. And my truth is that until I reduce the number of food thoughts I thought about consciously, you see, the program lets you reduce your 
the, de the your daily visual repetition of your food thoughts, which allows you to reduce your daily chewing behavior. Once you reduce your daily chewing behavior, you will in the process be able to develop new tools to manage your emotions and therefore the people and situations outside of you. So if you really want to turn your certain things in your life around, you really think, oh, you know, I have the saying, I am the common denominator. You know, you are the common denominator in your life. Well, you have to make a conscious decision. Do I want to let chewing run my life? Or do I want to let doing run my life? And if you want doing, whether quiet or not, whether quietly or not quietly, to run your life, then you need to, re to, fortunately or unfortunately, you need to reduce the daily number of food thoughts you think about each day. And that's not possible except with my program because this is the way I, I explain. I have this theory about how the brain works. I have a few theories, but I'm going to make it simple for your listeners. Let's say you had a chip in your brain and there were 35 squares in your chip and every day you printed out your chip. All right. And there were only two colors in your chip. There was red and green. Red is a food thought. Green is a non-food thought. A person without a weight problem would see 21 green thoughts a day and 14 red thoughts. But I guarantee you that a person with a weight problem would see 21 red thoughts and 14 green thoughts. So the person who sees 21 red thoughts is going to chew or think about chewing more a day than a person with 21 green thoughts. And that's why he's dependent on the food thought to manage his emotional lifestyle. So the trick is to consciously reduce the number of times a day he sees a red food thought. How do you do that? You do it, Jimbo, by always having enough and stopping yourself. And what happens when you have enough of something? Do you think of it more or do you think of it less? You think of it less. Well, welcome to my program. <laughs> My program gives you the conscious choice without even knowing it's happening to visually reduce the number of visual repetitions of any food thought over the course of 24 hours. Wow. And so you're saying over the course of 24 hours. Well, when so... I say 24 hours, I mean, let's, I, I like a, a, over the course of a week. Yes, it does. Hmm. It does. But it's a process. You know, you start, you ha it takes 21 days to change a habit. So for those people who are listening, who are tired of dieting, you know, dieting is like putting water in a hole with a bucket with a hole. Why do you want to put water in a bucket with a hole when you're going to lose your, you're going to lose your weight and regain it? I can't do that. You know, that's just not my thing. So first you say, okay, I listen to this woman, you know, I don't know. She's, uh, she's saying something I never heard before, but you know, I'm so tired of dieting and I do want to let some weight go and get healthier. I'm going to step out in faith. I'm going to buy this woman's book, you know, and so you buy the book, then you say, okay, I think I'll read the woman's book. And then I, and then if you have any questions for those of you who might consider buying the book, if you email me, um, it, then I would answer your questions for you because I'm on a mission for people to get back their power, you know, from food, from food. Very good. And Oh, what about, um, so as so you mentioned food, but what about uh, hydration? Is that important? How much water you're drinking throughout the day? Okay, well, I'm sure the nutritionists would like throw, <laughs> throw balls of raw meat at me. But um, look, true confession, I'm not a nutritionist. I have two. I was an educator. I have two master's degrees. They have nothing to do with, with what? Oh, with nutrition. <laughs> They have nothing to do with nutrition. I have no interest in nutrition because that's not the problem. You know, you can take a person who's an overeater and, and you can send them to a nutritionist. And you and the nutritionist says, oh, well, eat this and eat, you know, and all this stuff. But at the end of the day, the person's an overthinker and they can't consciously control the visual repetitions. How long do you think that that person's going to eat what the nutritionist said? Because the nutritionist is a diet someone else's rules okay so it's so here's i am a behaviorist i say you have a problem what's the problem here's the problem 
hand to mouth, hand to, okay. Picture, hand to mouth, food. Picture, hand to mouth, food. And then you gain weight. So if this is the problem, picture, hand to mouth, what you gotta do is fix the pictures. So I'm a picture doctor. Whatever problem you have, I can think of a way to reduce the number of visual repetitions and not that and and with not that much difficulty because I make it really simple because kind of my specialty is to make complexity really simple because I taught really challenged kids and I had to find a way to reduce everything. So I'm a natural reductionist, you know? So to me, so to me, until you reduce the number of times a day you think about food, you're gonna be struggling with food your entire life. I, I, I put that in writing. Wow. Yeah, there's and, no way out. There's just no way out. I would have found it. I would have found it, trust me. There's only one way out and that's to feed yourself enough and to know how much is enough before you eat. And the marker lets you do that. And this, this philosophy, honestly, you have me mostly sold on this. I'm definitely going to need to try it out for a bit. Sounds interesting. But what about the other people? How do you convince them? Imagine if, you know, there's a person that's just a chronic diet or paleo, keto, yeah, gain, yeah, yeah. lose, um, fasting, you know? Yeah. How do you convince those types of people? I don't. <laughs> you know, I tell you what, I don't. I, I, I'll tell you one thing I've learned. I can only bring a horse to water, but I can't make them drink. So I'm not going to talk anybody into anything. What I'm going to do is lead them through a series of questions. And then I know their answers before they answer them, because I know this topic intimately and I know what their mind looks like. And once they finish as answering my questions, I'm going to say to them, um, is this something you'd like to try? And then they will make their own decision. I, my job in life is to make decisions for no one. But I, but I take them because, see, I don't want to work with anyone that doesn't say yes out of choice. Because when I tell you that I'm, I, I'm not going to make them do it, it's not my job. You can't pay me enough for that. I just want someone who's a willing partner. You know, I don't make anybody do anything in my life in general. So if, if the person... The only person who's going to work with me is someone who's dieted, really gave it their best. It doesn't work for them. And what I say makes sense. You know, what I say makes sense, which to me, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, here's the deal. You only have one life and then you leave. Okay. You have to decide in this life, do you want, are you going to run the show or is food going to run the show? So think of yourself as a playwright. You know, I go to theater a lot. Think of yourself as a playwright with all of those scenes that make up a play. Give your life a, a title for the play and then ask yourself, do I want food to run my life, my whole play until I'm underground? You know, and, and I absolutely was adamant about finding out why I perseverated the way I did about food. And I found out. I found out, but I, I'm not selling anybody. <laughs> I, I'm an educator. I'm going to tell you that all your listeners can go on a diet and I promise you they'll re they'll lose their weight. They'll regain it. But I only want to, I'm like, I just want to do it once. I want it once. And then I want it over. So I know you mentioned animals. How was it like walking with lions? Oh my God, you really read my blog. Oh my God, you know what? Thank you. I <laughs> I'm really honored. I'm really honored that you read my blog because my blog means a lot to me. When I'm in the home at 120, I feel that I'll have, that's my what I'll look back to and I'll remember my adventures. That was one of the most exciting moments of my life. Um, you know, I was the only one from the tour that signed up to do that. It was my last day in Johannesburg. And um, I... Uh, I was scared to death, but on every trip I do something I'm very scared to do. That's very important to me. 
um, I like to push myself. So, um, yeah, we got to this beautiful farm, just like you see in Africa, and they gave us lunch. And then they gave us, they taught us how to be with the lions, you know, the, the hand signals. And I just said, I'll kill the lion. That's it. You know, that's just me. Lion messes with me. It's over. You know, I, I was a school teacher, you know, like, forget it. You don't know what I had in front of me. So after those kids, I figured a lion, you know, I'll just say, hey, you want to learn to read? So, <laughs> so he, they taught us how to manage the lion if he got bad. But we only walked with six-month-old lions. And to, and then we had people walking with sticks, you know, people walking with sticks. And then we got to feed the baby cubs, which is like little cats. I mean, that was amazing. I can't, I'm so impressed you read my blog. Thank you. And, um, and then we saw the real lion, the big one. And that's like, you're dead. I mean, you're dead. It's like, you're really dead. But the six month old, they don't grow their mane, I think, till they're a year old. So even the cubs, even the cubs, um, and I was so proud of myself that I did it because nobody wanted to go with me, you know, I went alone. And, um, but um, it was an amazing experience. I tell anyone who goes to Johannesburg to do the walk with the lions. You know, that was so cool. And but again, it doesn't matter where I travel, Jimbo. I have my green technique, my red technique. It just doesn't matter because I'm very committed to being okay with food. I'm just very committed. And I was um, thinking, you know, concerning animals, do you think this no dieting approach could be similar to how a lot of animals eat too? Do you think you know, it's the most natural way of eating? You see, that's a great question. You use the word that I honor, but it doesn't apply to overeaters, and that's natural. You see, like a normal person, because I've, ha I've had normal friends that don't have food problems, and I've watched them. A normal person that doesn't have a food problem, you know, they go, I think I'll have scrambled eggs. I feel like I want scrambled eggs. They say, you know... I don't, when I had it, okay, so there's books written that there are two kinds of food thoughts, it, uh, the two kinds of times to eat. If this is not what I said, other people have said this. I have a different thing. They say there's mouth hunger and stomach hunger. Well, all I had in my life was mouth hunger. I didn't know any stomach hunger. Who knew from being hungry? I had no idea. I just ate. When you see these people in these restaurants where they have buffets and you know, and a lot of food. You really think they're hungry? No, they're just chewing. Next time, watch people. They're just chewing. It's not the food, they're chewing, um, you know? It's like praying, but they're chewing. I say, go to God and pray, <laughs> you know? And and instead, so it's it's not about the food, it's the chewing, which, which I don't talk about in my book, but uh, it's really, it's too complex and uh, I don't want to, I made, I made the book very simple. You want to eat and stop. You want to lose weight. You don't want to fight with food. Just use the green and the red technique. I talk you through it. You get a chance to practice it. You get, and, and then you're good to go. Because as an educator, what I've learned, people don't want to be overwhelmed. They want it simple, you know? And I spent 30 years in an inner city school where, trust me, I learned simple. So, um, you know, I, to me, if it's not for, a, I can teach my work to a fourth grader. And that to me is my excellence for me. Can I take a fourth little grader, little kid who eats too much and teach him how to eat and stop and make believe he's a traffic light. So I would put a custom of a traffic light on him and I would teach him the two techniques. And then I would say, oh, are you being green or are you being red? You know, it's, I know I, I'm, I'm just like that. <laughs> I'm an educator. Speaking of educating, how do you think you had to improve yourself as a coach to sort of teach people your ways? Because you obviously have one-on-one -on -one clients, but what were some big lessons that you learned working with those clients about both yourself and your teaching ability, and also maybe what your clients may have learned from you. 
I'll tell you the biggest thing I've learned that if you don't want it, it's not going to happen. And I'm not going to make you do it. You have to be committed. You know, I, I'm not the kind of person who's going to beg you to do anything. I'm not going to cajole you or beg you. I, I'm very kind of, um, you know, I, I play to win. You know, that's just who I am. You know, I play to win. And even if I lose, I have to win. So I don't mind losing if it, it's to my benefit. But if I'm working with a client, if I see the client is doing their best, I give you 300%. But if I see the client is really not committed to even trying, then I'm not the right person for you. Because I hold you, I hold you accountable. And if you don't hold yourself accountable, we don't have a connection. I want you, I know what, look, I, I end my book with this saying, um, inch by inch, anything's a cinch, yard by yard, life is hard. And you don't see the harvest on the day you plant the seeds, all right? So, you know, I'm not for everyone. That's why I wrote a book. <laughs> You don't need to have me. All you need is my book. And that's really why I wrote the book, because um, I'm at a place in my life where I want to share my life's work with you. But, but you don't need me to have it. Even, But if you get me, you're very lucky. <laughs> if, you can if you can take it. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm not going to go after you to do the work. I mean, I had a father growing up in Brooklyn, if I couldn't spell a word, he'd say, go to the dictionary. You know, that's how I was brought up. So I'm not doing anything for you. <laughs> because the strength I bring is my ability. This is the strength I bring to a client. I immediately know what your ability to absorb material is and what the breakdown you need is. I am, I'm really skilled like that. So when I teach you the work, I am so good at getting you to understand it because I immediately understand the road I have to take to make it simple for you. And that comes decades of working with clients and kids. And I just know, I know what your limitations are, how to get past them and how to bring you in and make yours the best possible. I really, I know, I know people, I know what people can handle and what they can't handle. But I'm not for everyone. I'm only for someone who really wants to commit. Because I'm going to hold you accountable. <laughs> I mean, I hold myself very accountable. So why wouldn't I hold you accountable? But this is only in my professional life. Don't get me wrong. In my professional life, I'm very professional. But uh, I don't. You know, this is just the professional person that I am. I hold myself very accountable. I hold you accountable. And together we can really make it happen. But if I'm going to always be accountable, but if you're not accountable, I'm not the right person for you. Exactly. And as I continue on with this, that's a different trait that you also need too. And I noticed on a lot of your trips, it kind of proves the point that you're actually doing things. You're not living in the chewing lifestyle all the time. You know, if you want to enjoy yourself, you know, you do things that are enjoyable. You don't just eat, eat, eat and intoxicate yourself with that. But a big thing, let me get to the big thing. You, you mentioned accountability. Yeah. You know, I think a lot of, what do you think? A lot of people, you know, will blame their bodies. I'm an endomorph. It's society. It's what my parents are feeding me. How do you actually begin to take accountability in your life? Oh, Jimbo, that's the six, the sixty four thousand dollars. You look very young to me, so that's the sixty four thousand dollars question. You remember that show? That that's the sixty four thousand no. dollars question. How do you take? How do you take accountability? I'll tell you how it came to me, but it's different for everyone. I just grew up in a house where um, my mom would always say to me, "As long as you do your best, it's okay if you get a D." as long as it was your best. Um, my dad, you know, he was a tough driver. You know, he wouldn't even spell a word for me. So I came from a dad who wouldn't spell a word for me to a mom who expected the best. And, um, 
here's what I say about what you said. A lot of people don't want to take responsibility for one reason and one reason only. Because it's work. It, it, I, you know, I hate to like say the dirty word, but it's work. Let's say whatever you want to change, I, I'm, you got to do the work. You just got it. I mean, I know it sounds trite, but it's work. Like if you get up in the morning, you say, I want to learn to manage my money. Well, okay. Um, did you take a class on how to manage your money? Did you read a book on how to manage your money? Did you take notes on the book? Did you, uh, did you go to the bank and ask them what your options were? Are you saving money for a rainy day? Um, you know, um, you see, you got to do the work and people don't want to work. People are lazy, you know, but I'm not interested in other people's laziness because I know where they'll be in 20 years, nowhere. And they'll still be blaming someone else because they don't want to do the work. So who's ever listening, whoever doesn't want to do what they don't want to do, which I completely understand. Ask yourself this, Tony, Ro somebody told me this, Tony Robbins has like the rocking chair test. When you're 120 in that rocking chair, will you regret having not fixed it? I mean, really, I ask, this is how I live my life, you know, like, will I, what will I regret? I didn't quite get that analogy. Can you, sorry, maybe me, you know. Oh, so just when you're 120 in a rocking chair, let's say you never fix your food problem. Would that bother you? If it doesn't bother you, then don't fix it. Oh, huh, okay. If you don't save money and you want to retire one day, then um, accept it. You see, don't fight it. Like accept it, save money, but you have to suffer the consequences. Oh, okay, okay, I get it now. All right, all right. Okay. Here's the deal, there's no free lunch. You know, there's no free lunch. That's what my grandfather, may he rest in peace, from Russia, he worked for $2 a week in a button factory, but he told me he put away a nickel, you know? Mm -hmm. It's a mentality, Excellent. you know? But unfortunately with social media and with people think they can have it really fast, you know, um, nothing good is fast. Everything good is slow. Yeah. Everything good is slow. People want it like, you know, it's like not true. Anything fast is bad. I mean, I didn't know that in my twenties and thirties, but I can tell you that uh, anything fast is bad because you've never taken a look at it. You just go in, you know, you just go in and you don't know where you are because everything's a process. I'm very process driven. So how do you know what's going on until you wait to see, you know, you can't make anyone. Um, usually people become more responsible when they hit rock bottom. Now, for the sake of time, uh, yeah. technical team, can you please bring up uh, Sora's website? Take oh, a look okay. at that. Again, Jimbo, thank you for looking at my blog. I feel very honored. <laughs> oh, so, what, what is um? So, what does this video kind of cover? Is this sort of a summary of what you said at the beginning concerning the green red? Yeah, rule? no, it's just. Yeah, I mean, I basically tell you my story, how I was an educator and I managed these kids. And one day I looked at food and I said, "These, how come I can manage these kids who walk, talk and do those other things? Um, but food has no animate qualities. And if, and I ask you to sign up for my, um, my make peace. Oh, you're no dieting. It's not your fault report. Okay. And, but I, can I announce some breaking news on your show? <laughs> Sure. I have a new blog that just went up and I just launched it last week because I'm writing another book. And um, my next, uh, it's my other uh, website is www.overthinkerscoach.com. And what I like to say is what in one session with one question, you can learn to zap negative and self-doubting thoughts. And that's what I teach in my next book. So I'm excited about that. Great. Thank you. Thank you.
As you scroll down, yeah, just scroll down for me. Let me see the rest of it. Ah, so there's a subscription. Yeah. There's the book, a weight loss story. So uh, for the metrics with coaching, is it one-on-one -on -one coaching or group coaching? One-on-one. Uh, One-on-one. Mm. One -on -one. I worked for a Park Avenue doctor for 10 years. I did groups. But for me, um, anyone, who's, anyone who's interested can fill out the form. We can have a free um, consultation. And you can tell me how unhappy you are, and then I can tell you what I offer. And um, I'd be glad to chat with anyone that fills out the form. Mm. And, and don't be scared away, but if you really want to, you know, no, do be scared away. Do be scared away because I want you to think about what do you want for your life? Do you want to be run by that chocolate bar or do you want to put the harness on the chocolate bar and be in control? Okay, okay. Great. All right, so it seems like a very, you know, down to earth practical website. Just get straight to the point, video, buy my book. And also you could do some coaching if you want. I like it. Thank you. And you, then you would like my new one because um, it's very to the point, like absolutely. I tend to be to the point because, uh, you know, growing up in Brooklyn, working in Brooklyn and then living in Manhattan, you kind of like don't have an opportunity not to get to the point. You know, you don't have that much time. I mean, when you pitch media, um, you only have 45 seconds, so, 45 seconds. I went to a media pitching uh, event and I met, I had 45 seconds and they were timing me. Every producer had a clock. And if you went over 45 seconds, you had to walk away. So I'm, yeah, it's, it's really intense. So I had to have a media sheet and I could only do a 45 second pitch. And I, I did it with 85 folks over three days. And that changed my life forever, you know. So that media pitching event, so that was one of the things that kind of helped you to hone some of your marketing skills, right? Well, Just my mom, yes, totally. Like I learned, I can pitch in my sleep now. I, I get it. Um, it was, I had a meet, I had a coach and I did the summit. So, um, the coach taught me how to pitch and then we wrote pitches and then had to turn pitches around. And, um, and then I got to use that with a, a, a media one sheet, um, a, you know, a media sheet. And I had 45, every producer had a clock or they stood there with a clock, 45 seconds next. It was terrifying. But, but that's how I really got good. I have to, but, but you see, again, I put myself in that position and it, take, it took a lot of courage for me to do that. And that's, that's quite interesting. Now, I think a big thing I wanna get into now is sort of what's the future of your business? What other plans do you have writing a new book? Maybe, you know, some well, different yeah. types of blogs, like well i want to build my legacy you know i'm at a place in my life where i want to build my legacy so i'm writing my next book and then i want to do a ted talk uh i want to do a ted talk and then i want to write kids books because i really believe i belong back in the classroom you know um i think teaching is a performance art and i know that i'm good at it <laughs> so um i would like to be with kids again so I already have the idea for like five kids books. I've already found my resources. You know, I'm very big on resources. And um, and so like, I, I always wanna work, you know? I always, I love working, you know? I love creating. <laughs> there was a children's book called Stone Soup where this boy, he goes in, there's this woman, she's poor, she has nothing to eat. And the, the guy knocks on the door and the guy, and, she, she goes, did you bring me food? And he says, yes. And he had no food, but he took a rock and he put it in the soup and somehow they made soup. I like to take nothing and make it something. You know, I love to be challenged. I like a good challenge. I didn't know that about myself, but I really like doing what can't be done. I enjoy it. I like figuring it out. I like the angst of figuring it out. Well, speaking of figuring it out, 
What's your favorite piece of jewelry? Oh, I have so much jewelry. <laughs> I just love you attended the uh, New York City and Watch show. The New York City what? The New York City Jewelry and Watch Show. Oh, you know, I wanted to see what really expensive. I don't own any real jewelry, but I have lots of costume jewelry. But my mom, may she rest in peace, she was a jewelry person. So I became a jewelry person. But I don't, I went there to see diamonds. I'd never seen, you know, I said, okay, if I, I challenged myself. I said, if I can buy one piece here, what would I want? And I said, I have to, only one, only one. And of course I found a necklace that was a quarter of a million dollars. <laughs> and so I asked the woman um, if I could take a photo of it. And uh, she said, yes. So I put that in my blog. Oh my God, I put that in my blog, that pink necklace, um, because I thought it was so beautiful and so feminine and, you know. But um, here's the good news. The good news is that I don't need things I'm more about, I'm about experiences. I'm not, you know, I love experiences. Like, I just love experiences. To me, that's wealth. You know, like having, uh, I don't need, I need what I need, obviously. And I have what I need. But I'd rather save money and take a trip. Because I love different cultures and um, I love, you know, things like that. To me, experience is the highlight of life. Not, I'm not into like designer stuff or anything like that. It's just like, I'm more like, give me an interesting experience, like pitching 85 producers in three days. And that was expensive. But I thought, oh my God, what an experience, you know? So I, I, I enjoy spending my money on experiences. Um, you know, but I have a lot of costume jewelry. <laughs> I will admit that. I even, I even, um, I even use it to help me not go to food. Like, um, for example, I have these two bracelets that I wear every day. One is red and one is green. So when I want to overeat, I just move my green ones, and that's my green technique. So I move, I move the beads and not my mouth. That is very unique. Well, um, yeah, I mean, look, hey, what's a girl going to do, you know? I'm not going to listen, you know, like I had to find solutions. I'm, I'm not for everyone, but for anyone who's smart, I am. <laughs> this has been a great interview. Can you give uh, me, you know, some final uh, words? Oh, right. Some, and I also like to give... A special thanks to some of our sponsors. Um, Allison, she has a great book coming out, so read it too. Uh, so, Sora, can you kind of give me a bit of a end off here? Kind of, what are some final words you'd like to say to the audience? I would like to tell everyone who's listening to this to never stop believing in themselves. That that never stop believing in themselves because um and and look to prayer when they're and when you're not feeling well look to prayer find a spiritual life because outside of all of us and all of these things there's a higher power that can help you whenever you're in need it can always be with you and you're never alone and never to give up on yourself and never to quit never quit you can rest but never quit so that's what I'd like to share. You can rest, but never quit. Excellent. All right. I am Jimbo Paris, and this is the Jimbo Paris Show. Thank you again, Sora. Thank you for listening to the Jimbo Parish Show. 